Greetings and good evening. I think for most of you this is welcome back and uh, we're delighted tonight to do something that's uh, sort of unusual. Uh, it's a, a dramatic reading of primary documents, the documents generated at the time by people who uh, came to this area, settled here. Uh, one of the interesting things as a historian is just how hard it is a lot of times to see the world from the perspective of people in the past, right? Because part of the difficulty is that we know what's going to happen, okay? And so just as for many of us, it's difficult to see how our own lives might unfold from here forward, it was just the same for other people at a different time who couldn't read their own history and find out how the story ends. So tonight we get to sort of enter into that by listening to the possibilities and dilemmas as people saw them. Uh, if you are coming tomorrow, you can fill out an evaluation tomorrow. If you're just here tonight, then if you haven't filled out an evaluation afterwards, if you would, that would be wonderful, and I can collect those. Or Professor Unger, who's seated back here in the back, can collect those from you. And we certainly welcome all of you tomorrow, if you want to come, to our uh, lecture and panelist discussion following it. 8.30 is Continental Breakfast, and nine, right here, and 9 o'clock we'll have Dr. Jennifer Lund Smith of the University of North Georgia, the old North Georgia, right, college and state university, and she'll be speaking on the development of education after the Civil War in Georgia, and then We'll have some panelists from Georgia State University and from Barry College to kind of respond to her remarks and we'll open it up for questions and discussion and I think it should be a wonderful time. So uh, breakfast at 8.30, talk at 9, panelist discussion about 10 and, and then we'll send you home before lunch is over and you've got the whole rest of the day to do whatever you need to do then. So without further ado, we welcome to the stage Nick Cothran, Kate Johnson, Stephanie Hetrick, Levi Penley, all of them students here at Reinhardt University for a presentation of Echoes of Cherokee County. Thank you. Eighteen twenty nine. Gold in Georgia. The following is, a, is an extract from a letter to the editors of the New York Commercial Advertiser from Habersham County, Georgia, relative to the alleged discovery of gold mines in that state. Digging for gold is now all the rage in this country. Several experienced gold hunters from North Carolina are searching through many parts of it, and already seven or eight valuable mines are working, and others have been discovered. Several of those in operation are said to be more rich than any in North Carolina, the owners of some of them averaging eight or ten dollars a day with only two or three hands. Large lumps are sometimes found. I saw one a few minutes ago, found by Mr. Powell out of a mine of his about twelve miles above here, and brought by him to this place worth twenty-six or twenty-seven dollars. This gentleman, it is said, purchased the tract of land on which the mine is situated a short time past for a trifling sum about four or five dollars, and now would not take two thousand dollars for it. Gold mines in Georgia and the Cherokee Nation. We were yesterday shown a file full of gold from the mines of a beautiful color with various specimens of the stones and sand in which the precious mineral is found. When the cry of gold mines was first founded among us, no person dreamed of the extent and quantity of the mineral, which existed in the country, and most were disposed to regard the whole subject as a matter of ridicule. But we are assured by a gentleman, gold has been obtained there in the country of Habersham, Georgia, at the rate of a million and a half of dollars per annum. Single pieces have been found which were worth $75 or $80 each. 's State Assembly, laws extending jurisdiction over the Cherokees. 
December 19th, 1829, and December 22nd, 1830. Section 15. And be it further enacted that no Indian or descendant of any Indian residing within the Creek or Cherokee nations of Indians shall be deemed a competent witness in any court of this state to which a white person may be a party, except such white person resides within the said nation. Section 2. And be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid, that after the time aforesaid, it shall not be lawful for any person or persons under pretext of authority from the Cherokee tribe, or as representatives, chiefs, headmen, or warriors of said tribe, to meet or assemble as a council, assembly, convention, or in any other capacity, for the purpose of making laws, orders, or regulations for said tribe. And all persons offending against the provisions of this section shall be guilty of a high dis misdemeanor and subject to an indictment, and on conviction thereof shall undergo an imprisonment in the penitentiary at hard labor for the space of four years. Section 11. And be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid that His Excellency the Governor be, and he is hereby empowered, should he deem it necessary, either for the protection of the mines or for the enforcement of the laws of force within the Cherokee Nation, to raise and organize a guard to be employed on foot or mounted, as occasion may require, to protect the mines. Cherokee Women, a petition, dated October 17, 1831. To the committee and council, we the females residing in Salakuri and Pine Log, believing that the present difficulties and embarrassments under which this nation is placed demands a full expression of the mind of every individual on the subject of immigrating to Arkansas, would take upon ourselves to address you. Although it is not common for our sex to take part in public measures, we nevertheless feel justified in expressing our sentiments on any subject where our interest is as much at stake as any other part of the community. We believe the present plan of the general government to effect our removal west of the Mississippi and thus obtain our lands for the use of the state of Georgia to be highly oppressive, cruel, and unjust. And we sincerely hope there is no consideration which can induce our citizens to forsake the land of our fathers of which they have been in possession from the time immemorial and thus compel us against our will to undergo the toils and difficulties of removing with us our helpless families hundreds of miles to unhealthy and unproductive country. We hope, therefore, the committee and council will take into deep consideration our deplorable situation and do everything in their power to avert such a state of things. And we trust, by a prudent course, their transactions with the general government will enlist on our behalf the sympathies of the good people of the United States. At headquarters, Etowah, May 13, 1832. Governor Lumpkin. Sir, in my last I informed you that we had received information that a collection of outlaws were digging gold near Carroll Line, and they intended to resist the state authorities. I learned from Colonel Williamson, who was sent to arrest them after making a laborious examination, has not been able to, to discover the slightest traces of any violation of the laws on this subject. The Sixes Mine are situa situated about midway between this place and Camp Lumpkin, 25 miles from each, which makes it very laborious to guard them from either place. I have determined to detach Sergeant Raywith with a small command and station him in the, in the immediate neighborhood. This is the only way we can entirely suppress the digging and will afford the best opportunity of apprehending the aggressors. It is Colonel Williamson's decided opinion that the work at these mines is conducted by white men, and he has a strong reason for this opinion. For some time, for some time past, it has been necessary to make almost daily excursions to the mines in this neighborhood to prevent a violation of the laws. I regret to inform Your Excellency that an Indian was shot and killed on Wednesday by Mr. Tate, respectable citizen. These are the circumstances as I understand them. Mr. Tate had for some time been missing his hogs. On Wednesday morning, they run home and two dogs after them, one of which he shot. On examining the hogs, one of the largest was missing. He then, in company with another gentleman, took their backtrack, and after about going about two miles, they came upon three Indians cleaning the hog in the side of a pond, one of which they succeeded in taking. He was carried before a justice and committed to jail. After he was committed, he induced Tate and his companion to take him back, under a promise that he would show the other two Indians. After following him some time, they believed he was trying to impose on them. They abandoned a further search and, he, and commenced their return to the justices. 
when within about a mile of his house, the prisoner broke to make his escape, and after running 40 or 50 yards, he received a mortal wound from Tate's rifle and expired in a short time. I expect to see Esquire McConnell tomorrow and obtain an official statement of the case. Should it differ materially from the foregoing, you shall be informed. I regret that this should have happened. Whether the Indians will attempt to avenge his death, I cannot say. I shall endeavor to have an inquest held on the body that we, may, that we may be able to contradict any misinterpretation of the matter. I have the honor to be most respectfully your obedient servant, signed John Coffey. From the headquarters of the 1st Brigade, 12th Division, May 13th, 1834. To His Excellency Wilson Lumpkin, Dear Sir, you will receive by the hand of Mr. Bryant the proceedings of a meeting of the citizens of Cherokee County on the subject of our Indian relations. They are such as require immediate attention. It is obvious to every person in this section of the country that is at all acquainted with the Indians that they are more desperate and hostile of late than is usual among them. From the situation of our settlements and sparsely populated country, I deem it necessary that some measures should be restored by your excellency to quell the invasion that is daily expected. The plan I think most advisable is to forward a sufficient quantity of arms and ammunition to the courthouse with a small guard sufficient to keep the arms so that the citizens could any time be supplied with arms and ammunition to meet any exigency that may present itself. I think their mode of attack will be on persons traveling or on small settlements so that it will be difficult to detect them. Should you think the necessity calls for the aid requested, you cannot have it attended to any too soon, as our citizens are in daily expectation of being massacred. I am, with due respect, your obedient servant, Eli McConnell. May 15th, 1834. The committee appointed make the following report. Whereas the relations now existing between the white and Indian settlers of this country is daily growing more and more important, both to the white inhabitants and to the traveler, in that we hear of repeated murders, violences, robberies, and thefts having been committed by the Indians, and our own county is not exempted from those outrages. No longer ago than last evening, one of our citizens, Dr. James Burns, was met in the public road by two Indians unknown to him, the one having a rifle gun, the other probably unarmed, at least with firearms. So soon as Dr. B had passed some 50 or 60 steps from the Indians, they fired on him and shot a rifle ball through the left side of his hat, the ball passing first above the ear, burying about half the breadth of the bullet in the skin. We are glad to say Dr. B is not dangerously wounded, though the eighth of an inch deeper would have undoubtedly destroyed his life. It is also true that there is a growing disposition of hostility in the Indians generally, which disposition must be arrested in order to ensure the safety of the white settlers of this country. Threats of the lives of our white citizens are daily and publicly made by the Indians. It therefore becomes the duty, as well as the interest, of the white settlers of this country to adopt some strong and energetic measures upon this all-important subject. Resolved, therefore, that owing to the sparse population of this county, the locality of the country, and the facilities of concealment of Indian outlaws, we are satisfied of the utter impracticability of enforcing the laws of the state in an efficient manner. Unless aided by military force from the state or general government, that His Excellency, the Governor, be requested promptly to cause such force to be stationed at suitable points as will protect our citizens and aid the civil authorities in executing the laws of the state. Resolved that the citizens of Cherokee County are in constant danger of assassination and other lawless violence. And in this situation, it cannot be expected that the ordinary operations of agriculture and increase of population can regress. And that consequently, without the aid required in the foregoing resolution, the policy of the state and the general government must be defeated by a disgraceful but necessary retreat of the population now here to a peaceful asylum for their families and a surrender of the country to the original savage occupants. Resolved, that we pledge ourselves mutually 
that for every citizen of the county of Cherokee assassinated by a Cherokee Indian and where the offender is not given up to the civil authorities within two weeks from the date of the offense, we will select three male Indians out of the county of Cherokee and put them to death as an atonement for the murder of such citizen. Resolved that we deprecate the necessity of the desperate course pointed out in the above resolution, but unless timely aid be afforded us, we must strictly pursue it or disgracefully abandon the country. Resolved that the editor of the Cherokee Phoenix be furnished with a copy of the third and fourth resolutions with a request that it be published in the Cherokee language in the said paper. The manufacture of iron in Georgia. The iron mines of this state are found in the primary and metamorphic rocks of the spurs of the Allegheny Mountains. Another range of them, of much greater consequence, is found in the Alatoona Hills along the Etowa River in Cass and Cherokee counties. A railroad already passes through this iron district. The Western and Atlantic Railroad, connecting at Atlanta with the Georgia Railroad, crosses the Etowa where this river makes its passage through the Alatoona Range at a distance of about 200 miles from Augusta. Here, the broad, shallow stream, obstructed in its course, falls over ledges of rock, producing good water power, which has been improved by dams between the mountains from 300 to 400 feet long. The iron ores are found on both sides of the Etowa River. To the southwest, they extend in Paulding County, and in the other direction through Cherokee County. The furthest place at which I have observed them being sh between Sharp Mountain Creek and Long Swamp Creek, in the northeastern corner of the county. So far as explored, their range is found to be full 40 miles, and their course about northeast and southwest. Southern Independence, an 1846 letter by Mark Anthony Cooper, Alatoona. We are blowing two good furnaces with a capacity for six to seven tons metal per day, producing from 20 to 25 tons per week. Agricultural implements, hollow air, pig metal, and wrought iron. In machinery, we make all kinds of gearing for cotton mills, grist and sawmills, cotton gins and horsepowers, threshers, wheat fans, plows, etc. Cast machinery for cotton factories, for looms, spindles, throstles, and cards. We are sending hollow air to almost every part of Georgia. We are making about a half ton of malleable iron per day when operating and have, on, and have on hand a stock of 30 tons bar iron and plow molds for market. We have a flour mill that can grind 8 to 10 bush, bushels per hour per run and makes good flour. Two corn grists, one of which only is now operating and grinds 50 to 60 bushels per day. There is a population of about 400 dependent on our operations for daily subsistence. We have water power without limit. In two miles and a half of the railroad to Charleston and Savannah, we are building a merchant mill capable of manufacturing three to 500 barrels flour per day. We are putting up a wool carding mill for Mr. Buchanan, in which is to be added machinery for coarse woolens. We have the foundation of a rolling mill laid and expect to start it by December next. To the people of Cherokee County, Georgia, 1850, fellow citizens, resolved that in the event of the passage of the Wilmot Proviso by Congress, the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, the admission of California as a state in its present pretended organization, or the continued refusal of the non-slaveholding states to deliver up fugitive slaves, as provided in the Constitution, it will become the immediate and imperative duty of this state to meet in convention to take into consideration the mode and measure of redress. Let the convention address the people of the South, and especially the people of Georgia, constituting by its extent and resources this empire state of the South, pointing out the advantages of building up our own prosperity and security, by erecting factories for the manufacturing of cotton, our great staple, by making iron and things made of iron, by growing wool and manufacturing things made of wool, by tanning leather and manufacturing things made of leather, in a word, by making at home, as near as we can, what we need. Seven men scolded to death. On Friday night of last week, seven men, mostly Negroes, were scolded to death by molten metal at Cooper's Iron Furnace, Cass County, Georgia.
the mineral wealth of Georgia. This section of the state presents a belt of country of metamorphic formation, that geological formation above all others peculiarly mineral bearing. That particular locality to which we now allude comprises four lots of ground of 160 acres each, situated in Cherokee County, one and a half miles from the town of Canton and about 14 miles from the state railroad. It is known as the Canton Mine and is recognized as a rich, prolific copper, lead, and silver mine. The company owning and working the mine is composed of the most respectable and influential citizens of the state. They were incorporated as a chartered company in December of 1855 under the name and style of the Canton Mining Company of Georgia for the purposes of for exploring for copper, silver, gold, and all other minerals and metals whatsoever. The principal vein of the mine is a full mile in length, running the best situated ground for mining to be found anywhere. Besides this main vein, there are three others running parallel with it with the indication of being equally rich. A shaft has been sunk into the depths of 200 feet and this shaft intercepted by tunnels at different depths and by what is called an adit level, some 100 feet long, and which pierces the shaft at the depth of 123 feet. As we have before said, the mine has been thoroughly explored, critically examined, tested, and analyzed by competent judges, among them Professors Daly, Gosian, and Shepard. These accomplished mineralogists and chemists have given it their imprimatur, and experienced miners and practical businessmen have pronounced the Canton Mine of Georgia to be one of the richest and with promises of being one of the most profitable in the old or new world. Joseph E. Brown taught school in Canton, practiced law in Cherokee County, sold land for $20,000 to copper miners, and became governor of Georgia in 1857 at the age of 36. A message of Governor Joseph E. Brown on federal relations, November 7, 1860. In my opinion, the constitutional rights of the people of Georgia and of the other slaveholding states have been violated by some of the non-slaveholding states to an extent which would justify them in the judgment of all civilized nations in adopting any measures against such offending states which in their judgment may be necessary for the restoration and future protection of all their rights. If the madness and folly of the people of the northern states shall drive us of the south to a separation from them, we have within ourselves all the elements of wealth, power, and national greatness to an extent possessed probably by no other people on the face of the earth. With a vast and fertile territory possessed of every natural advantage, bestowed by a kind of providence upon the most favored land, and with almost a monopoly of the cotton culture of the world, if we were true to ourselves, our power would be invincible and our prosperity unbounded. For the purpose of putting this state in a defensive condition as fast as possible and prepare for an emergency which must be met sooner or later, I recommend that the sum of one million dollars be immediately appropriated as a military fund for the ensuing year and that prompt provision be made for raising such portion of the money as may not be in the treasury as fast as the public necessities may require its expenditure. Millions for defense, but not a cent for tribute, should be the future motto of the southern states. To every demand for further concessions or compromise of our rights, we should reply, the argument is exhausted, and we now stand by our arms. Alexander Stevens, Georgia politician and future vice president of the Confederate States of America. The first question that presents itself is, shall the people of Georgia, Georgia secede from the Union in consequence of the election of Mr. Lincoln to the presidency of the United States? My countrymen, I tell you frankly, candidly, and earnestly that I do not think that they ought. In my judgment, the election of no man constitutionally chosen to that high office is sufficient cause to justify any state to separate from the Union. Should Georgia determine to go out of the Union, I shall bow to the will of her people. Their cause is my cause and their destiny is my destiny, and I trust that this will be the ultimate course of all. The greatest curse that can befall a free people is civil war. This is the speech delivered in Canton by a daughter of William Grisham in 1861 as a Cherokee County unit, the Cherokee Brown Rifleman, head off to fight for the Confederacy. Gentlemen of the Cherokee Brown Riflemen, 
I have the honor to appear before you on this occasion as the humble representative of the ladies of Canton and vicinity to tender to you in their behalf this beautiful stand of colors prepared by them expressly for your gallant company. In presenting this banner, they have acted from a sense of their high regard and grateful appreciation of your most noble and praiseworthy examples of devoted patriotism and Spartan courage, as well as in obedience to the impulses of women's generous heart and instincts of her sensitive nature when the invasion of her country's rights are threatened. We are now free citizens of a free and independent republic. That foul stigma of southern inequality, which the perjured traitors of the North had so long plotted to rivet upon us, has been wiped out by severing every tie which bound us to that union which abolition fanaticism has made detestable. And today, our proud empire state of the South, Georgia, glitters the brightest star in the glorious secession galaxy. The disappointed northern fanatical hordes of would-be tyrants, infuriated by the wrangling corruption of their treasonable designs, and incited by the bloodthirsty ravings of misery and starvation sent up by their paupered and degraded society, had raised their threatening howl of coercion, and were exciting their lawless and exasperated mobs to invade our free and happy country. When such perilous times that try men's souls were precipitated upon us, when the first blast of the war bugle was sounded in the south, when the first peal of the thundering cannon echoed on southern shore ere our proud Georgia soil had been contaminated by the invasion of a hostile foe, and when all the muttering fury of a bloody war instantly loomed up before us, you, brave volunteers, sons and citizen, citizens of my loved na native Georgia, with that daring courage that knows no faltering and unconquerable spirit that never surrenders, seizing your battle armor, belted on your swords, shouldered your rifles, and responded to the crisis in a manner potent with signification. Admiring your devoted patriotism and confiding with grateful hearts in your chivalrous gallantry, allow me, in the names of the ladies of Canton and vicinity, to tender you this banner emblematic of the independence of Georgia and of the sunny South. Receive it as a voluntary offering as a solemn testimonial of woman's devotion to rights and institutions of her country. Accept it as a sacred memorial that then calls you away from our midst. We shall ever cherish you for the most grateful remembrances and brightest hopes, that you will have our warmest sympathies and most fervent prayers, that your misfortunes shall be our sorrows, and your triumphs our glory. We feel well assured that this banner will never be deserted or dishonored in your custody. We fear not that its proud folds will ever trail in the dust, or its bright hues be tarnished by the heel of a foe. That should it become necessary to use the sword in defense of our rights, to appeal to the god of battles to decide the solemn issue, that under this proud stand of colors defiantly flying with an eternal resistance, you will meet the invading northern cohorts that may swarm our sea coast in all the distinctive fury of war. Should they succeed in landing on our shores, we doubt not that you will meet them on the beach with sword in one hand and a torch in the other to dispute every inch of ground until your trusty arms shall have victimized or driven from our shores our country's last invader, and you shall have planted in glorious triumph the unfurled banner of southern independence and human liberty. Should the protection of our independence and the institutions of our fathers require the effusion of your blood or the sacrifice of your devoted lives, should fate's decree that the battlefield should be your grave, your imperishable fame shall ever live in the hearts of your countrymen.